bonsoir. Moi, c'est le professeur Michel Degraff. Je suis enseigné linguistique dans MIT. Ça fait plus de 25 ans. So now, please raise your hand if you understand Haitian Creole. One, two, OK, OK. So now, for those of you who don't speak Creole, imagine for a second how it would feel if I were to keep speaking in Creole, although I know you don't understand at all. How would you feel? Yeah, frustrated, right? Um, well, that's exactly what happens to 40% of children all around the world, and especially black and brown children like me in the post colonies of the world. And so what happens is that they are being taught, actually mistaught and failed by teachers who speak in a foreign language. This is me when I used to be cute. <laughs> so imagine yourself as a cute child like me being punished, even beaten for speaking your home language. The language that surrounds you, that you breathe in, that you feel in, and that was my reality as a good Catholic boy in Haiti, where Creole was excluded. It was devalorized as, quote unquote, broken French. In Haiti, there are even schools where they post signs like these that say, I must always speak French, otherwise, I am the gorilla of the class, imagine. But why is this happening? Why are we suppressing our ancestral and home languages that carry our culture, our history, our identity? Well, in this talk, I will start by giving you some answers, but I'm going to start with my own journey to reclaim my native language, Creole. The journey actually started long before I was born, in 1492, when Columbus got lost in what was then Haiti. Columbus was aware of the power of language. So the first thing he did in Haiti, he changed the name of the island into Hispaniola. Haiti's inhabitants, the Tainos, were quickly enslaved, then decimated. Now fast forward to 1697, when the western part of Hispaniola was ceded to France and became Saint-Domingue. Saint-Domingue is where the French built the most profitable plantation economy in the world. And they did that on the backs of enslaved Africans from various groups, the Igbos, the Fongbes, the Congos, the Airways, and others. And Saint-Domingue really became what was then known as the pearl of the Caribbean because it was the largest producer of sugar in the world, and it was responsible for one-third of European trade in the 18th century. Now, in 1791, that pearl came crashing down because the enslaved Africans revolted, which led to January 1st, 1804, when Haiti became the first free black nation in the Americas. And now you should be asking, how did the Africans, who came from so many diverse linguistic groups, speaking Igbo, Congo, Ewe, etc., how did they manage to unite against the French? There was no Google Translate. There was no chat GPT. How did they do it? Well, the answer lies in the power of language, because at that time, there was an emerging lingua franca that later became known as Creole or, or Haitian Creole. And here, one of our major leaders for this fight for freedom, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, he too understood the power of language for nation building. He advocated the use of Creole as langue à nous, our own language, instead of French. Our act of independence was written in French, but the text itself was very much aware of the power of language, because there the Salines said that the Africans had been victims not only of French military might, they had also been victims of the, what the Salines called the eloquence of French agents. And then came two very tragic events within 20 years. In 1806, the Salines was killed, and then in 1825, France did at last recognize Haitian independence, but they did so by making Haiti pay, through gunboat diplomacy, 150 million gold francs. So, so there was an agreement that Haiti had to pay that amount for Haiti to be recognized as independent. So this ransom, which is worth today more than $21 billion, also included, guess what? the very value of the bodies 
of the enslaved Africans, which the French, 1825, still considered as the lost furniture. Literally, the Code Noir declared that the Africans were furniture. This ransom is at the root of Haiti's impoverishment throughout the 18th, 19th, 20th, and 21st century. Historian Marlene Do has called this ransom the greatest heist in history, turning on a billion dollars. And then in 1915, Haiti suffers an acute and chronic event. The US invades and occupies the country for 19 years. One of the first actions of the US in Haiti was to, guess what, steal the gold reserves in Haiti's National Bank, adding insult to the injury of the French ransom. Now, let's take a closer look at how the power of language has played a crucial role in France's neocolonialism in, in Haiti. In case that 1825 ransom was not enough to cripple Haiti forever, the French consul at the time, Gaspard Théodore Moulien, he saw an opportunity to further expand French influence through the deployment of French teachers and priests. Moulin was determined to make Haiti entirely dependent on France, and he knew that language and education were key factors for achieving that goal. So you should ask, did Moulin and his successors succeed? Let's find out. Let's fast forward to the 20th century, when Moulin's tactics have become enshrined in France's global francophonie movement. For example, the French president, Giscard d'Estaing, in the 70s, like it was for Moulin in the 19th century, he understood that the French language is to be used as a powerful tool for France's political and economic domination. Now, fast forward to Haiti in the 21st century. And this is a very small sample to show the ways in which both French and Haitian authorities, including Haitian media, have worked hand in hand to suppress the use of Creole in avenues of power, not just in Haiti, but throughout the Caribbean. Most recently, in 2021, French ambassador Fabrice Mauriès made a statement that was nearly identical to what you heard from Consul Molien in 1825. He wants France to have most influence in Haiti. Of course, this is for the benefit of France. Even though the Haitian elites themselves, they call French language and culture their own, quote, war bounty, butin de guerre. That's the way that Haitian elites call French in Haiti. The French themselves called it soft power. Well, that's brutal power killing us softly. And French politicians, from Moulin to Mauriès, are not alone in the use of language for power. Linguists themselves, in my own field, <laughs> have been instrumental in the creation of what um, Frederick Douglass called grades of humanity. Grades of humanity with Creole speakers at the bottom of the pit studying as early as in the 18th century. Now this is a quick sample through four centuries. 1785, Creole is for species that lack intelligence. 1889, Creole languages are for inferior races. 1982, perhaps that's the most striking quote, Creole languages are linguistic fossils, which means that when I started speaking Creole to you at first, my mind would have reverted back to a primitive state. Right? That's what it means, that when I speak Creole, I go back to the earliest down of, of humanity, like a gorilla, really. <laughs> so, and now, this is 2001, and even the New York Times, the venerable New York Times, claim in an interview with John McWhorter, imagine that Creoles are the most primitive languages in the whole world. But we Haitians can reclaim the power of our language, and that's exactly what I've been doing for more than 30 years, including here at MIT. Um, as you can see on this slide, most of my work is about Creole and in Creole, including work on linguistics, debunking bogus claims against my language. I even have a couple of papers that are explicitly about the power of Creole, the power of Creole for learning to read, and the power of Creole for liberation. But you might be asking, how did I get from there in Haiti, where Creole speakers are rendered powerless, to here at MIT, where most of my work relies on the power of Creole. And that's a very long story, but I'll exert two parts. One about computation, and the other one about re-education. So that's the part about computation. So this is where 
my first epiphany happened in the 80s through computation, when I worked as an intern at Bell Labs as a computer scientist with linguists and AI researchers developing early speech recognition and text-to-speech systems. It's then that I discovered that the kind of rules, linguistic rules, that apply to English, French, Arabic, and so on, also applies straightforwardly to my native Creole. It was aha. This realization led me to understand that Creole is indeed a perfectly normal language, and this sparked my interest in linguistics and Creole studies. My second epiphany happened in Haiti. At that school in the 90s, founded by my late colleague and friend, Yves Desjean. It's a school called saint trois in English, Three Little Flower Center. And this is where, for the first time ever, I witnessed kids learning in Creole with joy and pride, a stark contrast with what I experienced myself as a child learning in French. So these epiphanies have led me to the founding in 2010 of the MIT Haiti Initiative with Dr. Vijay Kumar of MIT Open Learning, thanks to initial funding from the National Science Foundation, and to the brilliance and solidarity of many amazing colleagues and students at MIT, in Haiti, in the Asian diaspora. At MIT Haiti, we do remember Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and we use Creole to unshackle Haitian minds from centuries of intellectual and cultural ransoms. This unlocking of human potential is the basic rationale for MIT Haiti. We engage in direct action to open up access to quality education. We've developed a model to replace the stale French-based system that has failed most Asian children to date, keeping Haiti in misery for centuries. So the improved system that we're building is based on three pillars, or in Creole, trois wash de fait, and all three backed by science. Active learning, adapted technology, and Creole as a for instruction. And our efforts have resulted in positive changes in attitudes towards Creole and also in classroom practices. So that's a call for action here. In 2019, with support from the Jamil World Education Lab, JWL, at MIT Open Learning, Hans Miller and myself, we launched MITHaiti.net, an online platform to co-create and curate high-quality materials in Creole of, for all subjects and all levels. So our approach is very simple. It is based on the Haitian proverb, mais en pile, chai palou. Many hands make light work. So we now say educators in Haiti, in the Haitian diaspora, unite and join MITHaiti.net. So we use a Creative Commons license to freely share Creole materials, nearly 300 resources, and the resources keep growing with over 50,000 users and more than 250,000 page views, the platform has exceeded our expectations. And most of the users are in Haiti. And they are between ages 18 and 34, more than half of them. And, and we have an almost even split in terms of gender. So together, we can indeed create a brighter future for all. So now, here's our ambitious ideal endgame in four parts, really ideal. But this is MIT, right? We have to aim high. First, we ask for restitution and reparations. And second, we want to eliminate discrimination against Creole. We want to promote deep learning and want to build bridges between languages and cultures to enrich our humanity. Some exciting news, MIT Haiti is not alone. So there is a whole ecology of young producers, young creative types, also sharing our passion for the uplift of Creole. And here, we even have our current Minister of Education and the current ambassador to UNESCO, who are also part of this Creole movement. So we send a big shout out to these very many friends that make the load lighter. And just like Dessalines and his revolutionary army, we are fighting for humanity and our sovereignty. Pasque tout moun se moun and we're fighting for our lang anu, our own language, parce que toute langue c'est langue. Yes, Creole is the language of revolution. Creole, c'est la révolution. We need Creole for the liberation of our souls, our intellect, and our nation of Haiti. And I'm going to leave you with a jingle. You can get up and dance if you'd like. I would love you to dance. I know you've been sitting for a while, because this rapper, Big Tison Diffé, says it much better than I could. So let's listen to him for a bit. Personne n'a pas qu'à bailler puis bon résultat. Les la va prendre dans une langue qu'il pas comprendre. Pas comprendre. Gardez bon bête, cap couler. Bon matériel cap rouler. Qui bon? Sous 